Hi, everyone. I'm John Kasbarian, and I'm still the interim dean of the School of Architecture. It's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, today to the first lecture in our spring series, whose theme is New Proximities, focusing on a collective reckoning due to the global pandemic of health as a social, political, and spatial condition. I would like to thank our faculty student committee, which also includes Maria Nicanor of RDA, chaired by assistant professor Brittany Udding and Wortham fellow Amlin Ng for organizing the series and all the staff who assisted, particularly Christine Worley, who is our event specialist. Brittany and Amlin will provide a more detailed introduction to the series at the next lecture um, early next month. In addition, I've asked three faculty members to add their voices in the continuing series of faculty talks, starting with my esteemed colleague, Associate Professor Troy Sham, next Monday, uh, the 15th of February. But now to today's lecture, which was originally scheduled to be in person last spring, but canceled when the world shut down due to COVID. I'm particularly delighted that we start our spring lectures with the annual Llewellyn Davis Sani Innovative Practice Lecture. This is the 10th anniversary of these lectures, which have become legendary in the school for bringing the most innovative and distinguished architects from all over the world who are at the forefront of architectural research and who challenge conventions of professional practice. Previous speakers have included Elizabeth Diller, Fred Dust, Greg Pasquarelli, and Anne Lacaton, to name a few. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the kind generosity and leadership of Randir Sani, an alumni of the school and member of the Dean's William Ward Watkin Council, who with his family endowed this series. I'm extremely grateful for their support of the school and of our specific goal of celebrating innovation and creative thinking in both architectural education and the profession. Now I can think of no more appropriate office to be here today than LA Mass from Los Angeles, a nonprofit organization that designs and builds initiatives that promote neighborhood resilience and elevate the agency of working class communities of color. They work to ensure that these communities, particularly in Northeast Los Angeles, have equitable access to the power and resources needed to shape their futures. They approach community development by honoring local knowledge and culture while bringing together the power of informal and formal systems. Their focus in the community includes food security, affordable housing, and small business support. LMAS was founded in 2012 by Elizabeth Timmy and Helen Leung, who together combined design expertise with extensive public policy and community engagement experience to create an organization like no other, garnering national and international recognition for their unique approach to community development and engagement. We're fortunate today to have two representatives from LA Mass, and I'll start introducing, by introducing Chaz Kern. Chaz is a first-generation Filipina-American designer from North, Northern California. She is an organizer with the Designers Protest Collective an organization of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color designers dedicated to design justice in the built environment. Chaz holds a master's degree in architecture with housing specialization from the University of Oregon and a bachelor degree in architectural studies from Arizona State University. Elizabeth Timmy holds a master's degree in architecture from Harvard's Graduate School of Design and a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Southern California. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Emerging Voice from the Architectural League of New York, Los Angeles Magazine's Women of the Year, 
Curbs Young Gun of the Year, Next City Vanguard 2019, recipient of the Vanguard Big Idea Challenge, and exhibit Columbus, Washington Street Civic Leader. She has taught at numerous schools, including Cal Poly Pomona, Woodbury University, and Harvard. And she has lectured extensively and participated on juries widely. She has also written for journals and publications such as Manifest, Log, and Tabula Plena. And finally, on a note of personal indulgence, and Elizabeth, I hope you don't mind, many of you may have noticed a familiar last name. She is indeed the daughter of the late Bob Timmy, Danny's and my partner in Taft Architects. So it is with special pride that I introduce her today especially since she is also my goddaughter. One last thing, at the conclusion of the lecture, our intrepid student Zizang will host the Q&A, so please post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, please help me welcome Elizabeth and Chaz. Hi. Um, good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Chaz Kern, a program manager of the Backyard Homes Project and design lead for LA Moss. I'm Elizabeth Timmy, founder and co-executive director of LA Moss. We would like to thank you, John, for that wonderful introduction and personal note. It's especially meaningful. And also uh, thank you to Randy for your support and the School of Architecture for the invitation to speak today. We're going to be talking about our work over the last five years and the complexity behind building a bench, that's the title, and our recent pivot away from being a design-based organization into a place-based organization over the last year. So we are a group of majority BIPOC urban planners, designers, architects, policy wonks, and community advocates. Um, as a group, we collaborate on programs that support residents in Northeast LA facing food and housing insecurity. And we've worked most viral, vir virally over the last year, um, virtually over the last year, to develop two community-based programs um, that we'll be talking about later in our talk. My background is in architecture and design. Uh, I learned about LA Moss in grad school in 2016, and I applied when I graduated for a summer fellowship. And the standing piece of advice that I got from my grad education was to seek to work somewhere that aligns with my values. And so reading about LA Moss while in school, I saw that centering community voices was not negotiable and advocacy engagement were and still are foundational to the work, which really resonated with me because I always believed that design should be a deep collaboration with the people who the design will impact and that the people should be the center of it. Like Chaz, um, my background is also in architecture and I have spent the majority, the entirety of my career committed to social justice and using design as a tool, as a value that imparts identity and ownership has been deeply important to me. I began my career um, unpacking the limitations of bureaucracy and healthcare design and working on incredibly complicated construction administration for the largest metropolitan children's hospital in the US. And then working with Mass Design Group to explore design as a catalyst for social impact in Rwanda and Liberia, where I was able to unpack there the overlap between policy and architecture. From there, um, around as John mentioned, around 2012, I founded LA Moss because I saw the potential for design as a collaborative multidisciplinary approach to public projects and civic planning that could be used to support the voice and the needs of the community. We began as an urban design nonprofit that used architecture and policy to help communities help shape their future growth through pilot projects like alternative forms of affordable housing, public realm installations, and facade makeovers with small business support. In the last year, we have pivoted uh, to being a place-based organization and recently updated our mission this past summer to reflect our commitment to centering working class communities of color in our work with a focus on serving Northeast LA. Today, we are partnering with NILA residents to design initiatives that elevate community agency through empowerment and ownership. Our current programs include a weekly food distribution program, our backyard homes and program, and where 
we work with homeowners to build affordable ADUs that increase Section 8 housing stock. And we approach our work by honoring local knowledge and culture while bringing together the power of formal and informal systems. And we focus on issues like food and housing insecurity because they're intrinsically connected to systematic inequalities that face our working class communities of color. To give everyone a little bit of context for our work in Los Angeles, <clears throat> it's no secret that we as a city struggled to house all of our residents. Our homeless count as of last year was 64,000. And many of us expect for this number to drastically increase this next year. Housing in Los Angeles is very unaffordable for a number of reasons, but chiefly because we have not built enough housing for everyone. We have preserved housing stock for the few that have the privilege of owning single family housing over the expense of the many who live in housing unstable conditions. The median number of affordable housing units that the city of Los Angeles either subsidizes or funds annually is around the 1500 mark. With over half a million single family homes, we saw the potential to move the needle on the impressively low number of affordable housing units being built yearly by the city of Los Angeles. Also, it's a little known fact because most everyone outside of Los Angeles thinks of it as a city of sprawl, that LA is the most densely populated city in the US. Essentially, what that means is that majority of Angelinos are living in an urban condition while under a suburban footprint. Suburban communities like Pacoima and Panorama City, which were founded to meet the needs of white flight from city centers, are now home to thriving Latinx communities of service industry workers. Yet the low density suburban single family home has been a baked in component for our land use over the last 50 years plus. Today, half of all the lands that could be developed into residential in the city of Los Angeles is zoned for single family use. And this all changed in 2017, over three years ago, when state policy changed to allow for accessory dwelling units or ADUs to be added as a additional dwelling unit on a single family home site. It was in the early stages of this affordability crisis that we formed our three program areas that were aimed at supporting this neighborhood scale investment and lobbying for the inclusion of backyard homes, mom and pop shops, and first last mile pedestrian routes to be considered as equal to large scale urban development projects. Our first project, five years plus, was working in Watts in partnership with council member Joe Buscaino, a comprehensive neighborhood study which was issued and we were requested to install street improvements like trash cans, lighting, uh, beautification objects to support the small businesses. Instead, we expanded this definition of what small business support was to include the creation of a small business corridor with new logos for each business, new signage and an overall facade makeover. This project was the beginning of five years of work with over 40 business owners. We had the goals of meeting everyone um, at their business, offering expanded small business support coupled with these facade makeovers and doing what we were calling Design Plus at the time. We saw design as the entry point to a holistic conversation, digging into the deeper challenges a community member was facing and working with them to match them with resources to help stabilize their business and allow them to have a higher likelihood of surviving in a very competitive and under-resourced environment. However, after five years of doing this work, we are able to reflect that of the 40 businesses plus we worked with and supported, a substantial number we worked with did not survive. Today, one third or over half a dozen of these businesses for them, design was not the catalytic element that would overcome the decades of inequality and disinvestment that these business owners were fighting against. Design did not fix the relationship between the business owner and their landlord. Design did not fix the owner's inability to access cash reserves to weather an economic downturn. Design did not fix any of the systemic needs that an individual required when a family member became sick or when there was greater life instability. 
However, the businesses that thrived, that benefited from our support and collaboration, those businesses had economic advantages and a network of support and resilience that made the difference. For us, it became quite clear that we needed to strategically position our ability to support future business owners with a longer term commitment and an ability to extend our immediate network of support and resources to ensure every business succeeded. Before we were the storefront people, we were known as the group that could build benches and take over LA sidewalks and concreted areas of public space with brightly colored urban design installations. The reason why we decided to call this lecture, so I heard you build benches, is to spend a little more time unpacking the misconceptions around community design work and delve deeper into the implications behind public realm projects. This project on the screen we did as part of part of Exhibit Columbus along Washington Street, where we collaborated with local community members to program an area downtown, which housed primarily social serving organizations. The title of the project was Thank You Next, based on the Ariana Grande song, where she thanks her old boyfriend for all their help investing in herself. Um, and investing in herself is what comes next. So much of the design project was meant to say thank you to the past modernist architects and their vision for the future of Columbus. While also saying what was next was providing space for flexible community programming to unglue the urban environment from its uh, stoic and overly formal design, which prevented community groups from feeling ownership over their public spaces. From the furniture design to the pinup boards, the project was meant to invoke a feeling of corporate office rooms where civic benefactors were making decisions for investment on behalf of communities they weren't in contact with. However, like the majority of our public realm projects, this project was temporary. It also took longer to design, develop programming for the site, build and install this project than the project's actual total lifespan. And this permitting diagram showing the process we went through to permit one, pro one of our projects, Go Avenue 26 here, um, you can see all the bureaucracy, agency, oversight, reviews and submittals that one has to go through to get a six month project approved to the city of Los Angeles. And because this permitting process was in total 10 months long, in the end, we were issued our revocable permit after we deinstalled our temporary project. It has been said that bureaucracy is the laziest form of repression in LA. It's major form of structural inequalities that inhibit community ownership and identity. So more than any of our other areas of focus, the impact of this work is the most ephemeral. It has required the most significant investment of our time, problem solving resources as an office and creativity. It is incredibly rewarding to be able to transform the section, a section of the city that previously was so intrinsically anti-human in its design to give it an identity with scale and context to make something as banal as a sprawl of Los Angeles playful and full of life, that ha to have the city reflect the diversity, glitter, and joy uh, present behind the concrete. These have all been the benefits of our hard work and expertise. But in so many cases, we did not change the structural conditions of our public right of way, being secondary to, car to cars and residual to the networks of streets, highways, and overpasses. The rewarding nature of working on these projects is fleeting when one to two years later they're gone and we've painted and installed over five miles of public realm improvements. And the biggest takeaway for us is twofold. So one, policy like streamlining the permitting process is the biggest way to have an impact rather than doing one-off projects that demonstrate alternatives. And we currently have an adopt a lot policy to do just that. Um, which is working its way through council offices right now. And two, community members must ask for these improvements, otherwise they won't get maintained. And most importantly, there won't be a sense of ownership over these projects, which we see as assets and community members more often than, than not um, trying to avoid uh, these projects as tran transactional. It was in 2016, um, a bit in the middle of our public realm work that we were offered 
to partner with the mayor's office to build the first ADU in the city of LA under new state progressive policy law that was coming out in 2017. Our, par our pilot project sought to demonstrate that ADUs can be affordably built, contextually designed, and creatively financed. We partnered with the Bloomberg I team, Habitat for Humanity, um, a local CDFI or Community Development Financial Institution, to develop a mortgage path for financing and building something which at the time was an emerging housing typology. Our takeaway was that although we did a fantastic job of building the city's capacity and learning what to require when permitting an ADU, the house was still not built to be affordably rented to a local community member in a section of the city facing extreme pressure from displacement and gentrification. It was out of these learning lessons that we created the Backyard Homes Project. Our goal was to explore how the average homeowner could become a provider of affordable housing and make sure the half a million single family lots that we referred to earlier in LA were part of the solution. With an abundance of single family homes and lots in the city, we saw that there was the possibility for backyard homes or ADUs to be an alternative to traditional affordable housing methods. And we saw the potential of the Section 8 program existing and underutilized to do more. Our program was made possible because of the partnerships which we organized and coordinated half a dozen nonprofits and our housing authority. To ensure the ADUs were affordably built, we partnered with a local nonprofit contractor, Restore Neighborhoods LA. And to support homeowners who did not have financing options, we partnered with two community development financial institutions to create this new ADU mortgage product. The Housing Authority of LA, um, we secured a scattered sites approach, which was new for them, and also partnered with them to help us monitor the five-year commitment that was how we streamlined the Section 8 registration process. Because of our partnership um, very early on with this nonprofit contractor, we have been able to be design builders effectively and work together in the creation of seven ADU prototypes that give the homeowners an all in or a kind of baseline of cost. Each homeowner has a choice of an architectural style that can either reflect the context of their community or their personal cultural context as a homeowner choosing to share their backyard with a housing and stable resident. Some of the styles you can see here that are highlighted are craftsmen, modern and Spanish. We were deeply, uh, deeply inspired by Sears catalogs and other prefab homes uh, from the 1920s and 30s. And uh, we gave homeowners a variety of flavors and interior exterior style options to choose from regardless of unit type. After the homeowner selects a unit type, we pick a style for the interior, sometimes a different style for the exterior, which includes uh, colors, finishes, fixtures, hardware specifications that are unique to this kit that we developed. One important thing to note is that this plan was designed for a Section 8 tenant. The cool thing about ADUs is they can really uh, be responsive to whatever narrative or context or occupant. And for us, the Section 8 tenant meant to was meant to maximize the rental income while minimizing the construction budget so that the low to moderate income homeowners that we wanted to be able to participate could be included in this program. Essentially, ultimately, we set out to change the nature of how affordable housing was represented and depicted that ADUs could be a part of an important menu of options in affordable housing, and it didn't have to look affordable. It could represent the diversity and the spirit of inclusion that is needed for us all to pitch in and respond to the housing crisis. Our impact was that we built the capacity of over a dozen organizations to build affordable ADUs through the direct and indirect participation in this program. We're currently advising other agencies across the US how to take this program that we developed and scale it to work as an initiative in their city as part of their broader affordable housing strategy. To shape that project, we conducted over a year of research, talking to housing experts and over 100 homeowners to understand what it would take for someone to sign up for an ADU to be their affordable housing. 
And we didn't just get into the business of designing and building these projects. We also worked with the County of LA on an ADU program, which explored how forgivable loans could support ADUs and house the formerly homeless. Currently, we're partnering with the City of LA again to develop prototype plans that are pre-approved through the city's time-consuming and sometimes expensive permitting process. Even still, over half of our programs and initiatives that we were involved in, in regards to housing, did not result in built projects. Although we are building five backyard homes that will be section eight rental properties, when we launched this pilot, we received over 200 applications. This five represents the golden opportunity of someone's finances, their site, their comfort with taking on financial risk and their commitment to being a section eight landlord, which resulted in a 2.5% build rate to the number of homeowners that applied. Also, we realized that ultimately we were building the capacity of these homeowners in an individual context rather than a collective neighborhood led initiative for resident led affordable housing. The amount of work that it took to develop this program, design an affordable housing model that was a new typology of housing and to reach out with and to work with homeowners has been immense. Moving forward, we are excited to look at more models of affordable housing that can be more appropriately place-based in the form of community land trusts, intergenerational living, and housing cooperatives to start thinking about all the options available when working to make housing accessible and available for communities of color. So returning to these projects, we realized that we had organized our approach around our skills, our abilities, and for lack of a better word, our talents. The pitfall of this is that we focused on those talents and thought that the act of using our professional abilities uh, in concert and collaboration, that this approach was capable of addressing systematic issues and driving impact. We knew that together as an organization and as, as individuals, we were stronger collaborating on behalf of communities of color was what we were committed to doing. Over the last five years, we saw the evidence of our ability to do things that had been thought of as insolvent, impossible, untenable, um, unsustainable. However, we assumed that because we were creative and productive in our collaborative efforts, we were embedding impact into our work when in fact we were not, because we were not intentional about what that impact was. We began to look over the last year at our conversations with community members, residents, and stakeholders. And although there were some projects that didn't result in a long-term investment, we had engaged and co-created with the community. In large measure, these projects were the ones we returned to with core methodologies, deep lines of thought, and ideas that demonstrated the resilience and power inherent in communities of color. And although our intention was to be an organization that supported communities through design, in our efforts, we centered design as the primary thing of value because we were not explicit or intentional about our impact. In our pivot towards being a place-based organization, we are centering the community as the place that is central to our work. This transition from being a design place to design-based to place-based is an intentional commitment toward having measurable and meaningful outcomes to our residents, business owners, and community members that are the true center of our work. So the groundwork for our organizational transition began last fall. And we did some early discovery work with our team and community, getting the support of our board and having conversations with our partners about our plan shift. In January, 2020, a community development expert, Maria Caldillo, uh, led us in a team retreat where our collective values and new vision started to take shape. We also had conversations with our neighbors who expressed interest in creating a community resource exchange and shared their concern about housing and food insecurity in the neighborhood. We reflected on our commitment to working class communities of color and examined where our impact was neither meeting, was either meeting or missing the mark. So one of the ways that we've been reflecting and investing and in evaluating the community engagement impact 
on past projects is using the spectrum of engagement and building a framework for community ownership. And so this version of the spectrum is developed by uh, Rosa Gonzalez of Facilitating Power, in part drawing from content of numerous past uh, public, partition, public participation tools, including Arneson's Ladder of Civ uh, Citizen Participation, the Public Participation Spectrum, created by the International Association of Public Participation. And the spectrum, as described, charts a pathway to strengthen and transform our local democracies Thriving, diverse, equitable communities are possible through deep participation, particularly by communities commonly excluded from democratic voices and power. So the first item or instance on the spectrum is ignore. So this is where communities have, uh, there's no community engagement on a project and you're denying access to the decision-making process. The impact is marginalization and you're treating community as in, it's insignificant your message to the community is that they don't matter. So marginalization represents the status quo, given current systems um, have been historically designed to exclude certain populations. The second item on the spectrum is inform, where you are providing the community with relevant information, like hosting an open house or providing fact sheets to a community about your project. Inform is the foundation for taking action towards real solutions to the threats we face. If, however, community engagement from, um, sorry. If however, community engagement efforts remain at that level of one-way information sharing, such efforts result in placation. So the role of community is reduced to absorbing information from those with more positional power. Meanwhile, the notion that everyday people can actually shape solutions is stifled. The third is consult, which means to gather input from the community. It's the most common form of community engagement for architects. Uh, the biggest critique for this form of engagement is that the decisions are often already made when exchanging, uh, when, when engaging with the community. And so community engagement is just simply a check off the box. The next is involve, which is to ensure community needs and assets are integrated into process and inform planning. The impact is that the voice and power shift to community um, is to community organizers. Collaborate says that we ensure community capacity to play uh, a leadership role in implementing of decisions. The impact is that the power is delega delegated to community leaders and experts to achieve collaboration through community engagement. Um, there really needs to be this, this answer of what cultural shifts and system change need are needed for authentic collaboration between institutions and impact communities. The last on the spectrum is to defer to. Um, it is to foster democratic participation and equity by bridging the divide between community and governance through community-driven decision-making. The impact of is community ownership. As a team, we mapped out our past projects along the spectrum of engagement, evaluating these actions and impact of the projects in the lens of community engagement. The majority of our pre-COVID projects fell into the consult and involve. In the case of our public realm projects, we worked to ensure that community needs were community needs were integrated into the process and that community organizers had the power and voice to shape the project. So how do we begin to delegate power and how do we move into collaboration and beyond? So in order to move beyond involve, community organizing and power building is needed to bring community engagement out of tokenization and into true, true involvement of impacted residents in the decisions that impact them. And we are working through how to thoughtfully build community ownership. Where a project falls on the spectrum is in part dependent on how and when community is involved in the process. So our reflection is a work in progress, um, adapting the spectrum and overlaying our own project process to access potential strategies for community engagement and ownership structures. And our mission is to build community agency and resiliency. Um, and our current approach is to do that through community empowerment and ownership. And empowerment in this instance, we define as community having power in the decision-making process for programs and projects. 
It also means that the resources and knowledge are accessible, um, facilitating empowerment. On the spectrum, the actions uh, and impact that define empowerment are informed to involve. Um, and ownership speaks to owning place and program like land, programs, physical resources. And we acknowledge that there's a sense of ownership that happens through empowerment. And for the clarity of this process, we're defining ownership as um, the previously stated. Previously stated. So ownership of place and program uh, needs people to first be empowered where capacity is built in leadership, organizing, trust, knowledge. And the spectrum builds to community ownership to ensure communities have a direct say over what is needed to shape their futures. And our original plan was to transition into a more robust engagement process and a pilot program where we would be co-designed with neighbors. Um, at the moment to which we had begun to wrap our heads around what it would mean to become place-based and how to wind down programs and activities that no longer fit inside our areas of impact, COVID-19 hit. It took Los Angeles over six months to reach the same level of spread as a city like New York. However, we knew our community was already in an economically vulnerable position at the outset of the crisis. As we reconciled our lack of clear impact for working class communities of color, we also were becoming more involved in conversations in our home community of Northeast LA, which had been struggling to pay for the exorbitant rise in the cost of living in Los Angeles. Immediately, we were hearing from neighbors, residents, um, entire families affected by COVID and incapable of shopping and paying for basic amenities. Critical issues that were pointed out by neighbors during these conversations were housing insecurity and food access were only made worse by this national health crisis. And so when COVID outbreak uh, began locally, in March 2020, and after Safer at Home orders went into effect, we pivoted our operational model to provide immediate assistance to neighbors directly impacted by the global crisis. We started by reaching out to our neighbors, David De La Torre, who had Salesian Valley Neighborhood Watch in Hardin de Rio um, Community Garden, and Ceci Dominguez, who had Salesian Valley Senior Group. And they shared that neighbors were already checking in with each other through an informal phone tree. Um, learning that many have already been laid off, having their work hours reduced, struggling to take care of aging parents and getting groceries. And thanks to the ab everyday advocacy and partnership of two neighbors, we were able to create a more robust system to capture and track those needs and provide supportive services. And we formed the Northeast LA Community Response. Typically, most mutual aid programs focus on one area of impact. However, early on in our response, we decided that we would equally prioritize distributing goods and services, providing material assistance, and sharing information on rights and emerging policies to provide relief to community members. Most of our collateral and graphic language was inspired by the Point It Guide um, and IKEA's FICA cookbook that displays recipe ingredients. Because we were passionate about reaching the largest audience, we embedded capacity building content with a language less guide to communicate information without words. This is a graphic outline that explains our community response and how we were making touch points with community members during the pandemic. With a group of 150 plus dedicated volunteers, we called neighbors, identified needs, and connected them to resources such as free food delivery, rent, or mortgage information, unemployment filing. We were able to triage in a very quick matter of time which families needed what to be able to serve the most community members as possible with what we had. Our primary focus was on reaching residents in Frogtown, which is a community in Northeast LA, but serving the larger community. Mutual aid is something that, Frog Down, that the Frogtown community has long participated in through babysitting one of their children, exchanging food, and more recently checking in on the, their neighbors during the crisis. And deliveries like what is shown here uh, was a formalization of, on our part, uh, a system of resilience, which was already present in the community. 
craft kits for seniors and children were also given along with food staples and cash assistance because we felt that the mental health of both of these populations would be the most critically impacted by the sudden isolation. Kits included an inner neighborhood pen pal kit, uh, block textiles, printmaking, um, drawing and negatives. We ended up distributing over 850 kits for over 250 families. In a relatively short period of time, we connected to and developed relationships with multi-generational and immigrant families. The vast majority who had been facing food insecurity, reduced or lost employment and housing insecurity. For a temporary period, our program was able to help with one of their deepest concerns, which was debating between paying for housing and having enough money to afford to buy food. Offering cash assistance helped but it didn't do enough to address the deep debt our community members found themselves in, in order to survive this time. However, the cash assistance we did provide was essential in paying for phone bills, car payments, and other essential costs that enabled community members to apply for other assistance programs and continue employment. Upon reflection, a great deal of the work we were doing was to use many of the same skills that we had developed working to build the capacity of local government. We were organizing resources, explaining policy, navigating bureaucratic systems, and creating an actionable implementable program that was of tangible community benefit. To compare this flowchart of navigating the hurdles put in place by local and state government to inhabit unlawful use of public right of way uh, against the system we created, for a community member to communicate in need for assistance and uh, access resources is strikingly similar and profoundly different. One system is predicated on control and oversight while the other is supportive and interested in translating needs into action. In the context of the spectrum of engagement, this initiative represented our organization moving out of the confines of empowerment and into ownership. We co-created this program with the community. The community's participation was essential to the structure of the program. And we built the program off of an existing method of resilience and support already present in the community. However, we didn't structure the program where it could be developed into the ownership category because our inherent, because our intent at the formation of the program was to provide assistance to community members and not to build ownership over an existing resource that was mindful of assets and skills present and existing in the community. We knew that we needed to develop a program that would address long term that would that would address long term the inequality present already in LA made worse by COVID-19. So we closed our program after 10 weeks with the understanding and intention that we needed to build something that was capable of having community ownership embedded in its makeup from the outset and integral to its long-term operation. We also had to reconcile that we couldn't move fast enough to deal with the enormous pressure facing our community in Northeast LA. If Los Angeles was the most unaffordable city in the nation, uh, Northeast LA is the area with the greatest increase in rent due to these larger market forces and adequate local community plan updates that don't have safeguards in place for the future development projects. Displacement of working class communities of color is rapidly escalating as vacancy rates increase due to market speculation that don't match the speed of development. Creating, running, and fine tuning the community response changed us as an organization. And returning to our previous model where our impact was inferred and an outcome or product of our super duper impressive skills no longer fit our organization. If we were gonna to return to this model, it seemed to us a guaranteed reality that we would repeat our past missteps and centering the how of how we were doing the work rather than the who. In hindsight, what we were working towards unconsciously or consciously was community ownership and empowerment. We had talked a great deal about the working, the work being neighborhood scale. And in large part, what we were talking about was just an alternative version of community development. Once we uncoupled and removed the professional seats as central to our approach, it freed us up to begin to discuss what were the activities and programs that fit in this middle? What was the what of what we were gonna be doing? 
And we got incredibly excited about the prospect of being able to build an LA Moss 2.0 and the prospect of creating a collective vision for the future of our organization. So Maria partnered with us again, leading us in three retreat sessions designed to help us one, craft our mission statement, two, evaluate our programs, and three, create an action plan for the rest of the year. And this gave us room to articulate and refine what mattered to us. We then self-facilitated a process to refine our mission, vision, and values and approach, keeping the following in mind. Shifting power dynamics. So we believe that centering the most marginalized voices is necessary to achieve a more equitable world. Because of this, we needed to double down on our commitment to working class communities of color who have been historically left out of the decision-making process around neighborhood planning and investment. Celebrating the community. People shape neighborhoods and we, we couldn't engage in place-based work without highlighting and celebrating our community strengths and bringing their leadership to the forefront. We needed to commit to addressing tough issues, but also needed to make room for connection and joy. Bridging our past and future. So shifting away from a skills-based urban design nonprofit is no small feat. We wanted to be thoughtful about how we would, how we would be led by our community values while recognizing the way in which design remains integral to our work. During this process of rewriting our mission, we struggled to define our values because we had not done the work to become an anti-racist organization. And we could not articulate why we were committed to this new mission. We then hired the Castillo partners to help facilitate an anti-racism and DEI or diversity, equity and inclusion assessment and, and report as the first step in our commitment towards being an anti-racist organization. Centering the community members, advancing their concerns and goals and giving them space to lead were all key takeaways outlined by the Castillos. Ultimately, the recommendations in this report help plant the seeds for the next steps in our work, building our next program where we had explicit goals to address food insecurity while building community ownership. So in September of 2020, we returned to our efforts in providing relief to community members experiencing food insecurity. And we launched a weekly food distribution called the Northeast LA Mercadito at the Elysian Valley Community Garden with the support of other partner organizations like Food Forward and LA Compost. Since then, every Friday, we have been providing fresh fruit and vegetables for all residents, no matter their housing or immigration status at the Mercadito, free of cost. The produce varies each week and families can choose the amount and type of produce and items they prefer. We also have started a cell phone outreach list to give weekly notifications to families participating in the program. This program, the Northeast LA Mercadito, has run over the last five months and has reached over 600 families, mostly through word of mouth. We have translated and interpreted, interpret, we have translation and interpretation available in Spanish every week, and we're working in Vietnamese, Cantonese, and Khmer. At all, our day of program logistics and distribution are 100% volunteer led and resident supported. We developed a decentralized food system, uh, which is supported by local food hub leaders. And the majority of our food is now distributed through these hub leaders um, throughout Frogtown. Because we were intentionally building out an area for our program to be led and owned by the community, the program is thriving and we can now not keep up with the scale at which Mercadito is growing and community members are growing the program. Um, for example, our food hub leaders pick up food to distribute to 10 more families, which is helping double the number of families we serve. So through a combination of unpacking the limitations of our existing programs, defining the impact we would like to have in the future work, and testing our emerging model through the community response and the Mercadito, we are able to begin to fill out, fill out this missing middle in our approach. We've gotten much more intimate with programs um, and how we can lead to address the root causes we have been fighting against since we began. 
and have more clearly in who we're, and how we're helping. Before our shift to being place-based when we were a design-based organization, more often than not, we were bound by the limitations of the opportunities to do projects, which were set up by politicians and officials that would have impact if we squeezed it into the scope of work. Now, there's this range and scale of programs which we have the capacity to lead, develop, design, and build in collaboration with the community and with a deeper intentionality and understanding of who we are and what and why we are doing it. The future seems a great deal larger and more inclusive than before and we're really excited to share with all of you where we are going and where we have been. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth and Shazandra for this wonderful lecture. So now let's move on to the Q&A session. Um, the first question coming from Render Sani, um, they ask, what was the financial source that funded design and the construction? Also, what are some of the lessons, lessons learned? Um, previously, um, when we were a design-based organization, our financing was typically something we would call fee for service, but it came from different council offices and um, mayoral agendas and initiatives. And so there were things like the Great Streets Program where we were hired to redo um, over a mile of Western Boulevard in Koreatown or um, a quarter mile of Rosita Boulevard in Rosita. Um, and our financial model was really um, dependent upon these different agendas and us responding to them. Now, um, and, and at, the, at maybe two years ago, two and a half, three years ago, our financial model was 80% dependent on, on these um, methods of income and revenue. And in the last nine months, we've pivoted towards 60% of our operating income being uh, place-based and supporting his place-based efforts, which Chaz and I talked about, the Mercadito and the Northeast LA community response. Uh, second question coming from Joel Adams. They ask who owns the land for an ADU? Is this land purchased from primary homeowners or does he become a landlord? How is construction financed? Are these new occupants owners or tenants? So for the Backyard Homes Program, um, we are working with homeowners in the city of Los Angeles. So they either live on the property or they're renting it out to someone else. Um, the, what is it? The homeowners are paying for the construction of the ADU. Through this program, we uh, don't have um, financial support from local government to subsidize some of the construction costs. It would be a great help to have that. Um, we make a lot more than five projects feasible, definitely. Um, and within the program, because we have a collective of nonprofits who are running it, we are subsidizing the cost of design, in some cases, um, in administration fees for homeowners who are participating in the program. So we put in a lot of work up front to create those uh, seven prototypes to go through a very in-depth vetting process with the homeowners to um, essentially lay out their budget, their return on investment, um, all the potential prototypes that fit within their site so that they have an idea of what their investment is as they go through the process of building an AU over a year. Two of the five homeowners that we are building ADUs for are working with Self-Help Credit Union on uh, this financial product that we helped, we collaborated with Self-Help to develop and Self-Help Credit Union is the largest uh, credit union in the nation. And um, only two out of five because in the end, it was, it was still very hard for homeowners to qualify for even a, a progressive at the time in 2018 and 2019 when we were developing this. Um, it was still very hard for homeowners in low to moderate income communities to um, be able to um, qualify for this loan. So more often than not, you know, a big barrier was not having the thirty-five dollars to $40,000 of forgivable loan that we would have liked to put towards this program so that more homeowners could participate in 
you have to realize that in 2018, when we were developing this program, the idea that someone would give free money away for an emerging housing typology was bananas. And today that's much more on the table. And so we're seeing there being larger gains um, for backyard homes that are ADUs in other counties, uh, cities, and states. Question from anonymous attendee. Thank you for the talk. I'm very appreciative of the breakdown of your work as mapped on the spectrum of community engagement and the intentional reflection you've sh shared on how to create LA Mass 2.0. Can you share a little bit about your personal relationships to this place-based work? I'm deeply committed to social justice work. And I often think about what it means to come into a community as an act advocate and to already exist within one as a resident. I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on this difference. I was sitting on a panel last week for AIE New York um, with members of the Design and Protest Collective. And one of the panelists, um, Navi Hayir, uh, she was explaining that she was got interested or first kind of intersected into the social justice work because of her background uh, and her growing up as a Southeast Asian. That mutual aid was just built into that relationship and is a part of your life. And I thought that was so clear um, and really named because growing up in a Filipino household, like mutual aid, even though we didn't call it that, was so intrinsic to how we lived our life. And the relationships were so important with our neighbors, the communities that we built around us, um, when a lot of our family wasn't in the US. And so those relationships of exchanging food or babysitting um, were just very foundational to how we were able to support each other. So I think for me personally, um, my relationship with place-based work is looking at communities having power to support themselves, but also having the resources where they don't have to do that. Like it's, it should be um, given to them in a way that they, they don't have to struggle. Uh, my commitment to communities of color had, has started at a very early age and it was really solidified when I lost both of my parents um, in my early 20s and I'm an only child um, with not much extended family support. And being in Los Angeles um, at really at the beginning of my adulthood without a family support system or a, a kind of safety network or safety net, um, I felt, I felt included and loved by communities of color. I felt embraced by uh, small business owners in Koreatown, um, restaurants that I frequented in Little Ethiopia, um, businesses that I became, business owners I became close to in Little Tokyo. And I didn't have a word for mutual aid, but I felt that that strength and resilience was something that was very clear to me um, and very visceral in a time when I felt very alone. And so I, I kind of was shared, that was shared with me and it became my life's work to help support that in any way that I can, despite that my identity does not match um, this commitment. Um, question from Claire Wagner. Was it difficult to pivot from a design-based practice to a place-based practice? Did you need to acquire new skills and knowledge? And how did you manage to do so? This is difficult on a number of levels. I think because we care about it so much, um, the struggle is a part of it. Uh, on a personal level, I, I think like my background is in architecture and design. And so I personally embedded um, embedded a lot of my personal identity into design, which is a lot of my day to day. Um, and so shifting to a place based practice, I, I had to kind of reconcile the fact that design would not be centered, it probably in most cases wouldn't even be there um, in the traditional sense of capital A architecture. And so I, I think it came down to reconciling my personal values in the work over the process of which I was going about um, these things. And I think the, the skills um, 
studying architecture is a, was a good base to begin to think about how we could um, create models around community ownership. Um, but it's an ever expanding and never stopping <laughs> acquisition of skills and knowledge as we continue on. Um, and it's also helpful to have so many different team members with so many different backgrounds um, and personal histories that we, we can support on each other um, who has uh, maybe different skills or expertises than us in those areas. That's very well said, Chaz. I think it's been the hardest on the two of us. Um, however, I think if you really love the profession of architecture, you have to betray it because the profession of architecture is built to oppress and enact systems of power. And so it's a complicated thing and a bizarre juggling act. Thankfully, there are so many peers in the space uh, of kind of social, socially engaged work that are piloting a roadmap for what that looks like. And we've relied on, on others doing this work um, that have been doing this work that, um, uh, you know, you know, kind of lay out an alternative. And I think that it's been as challenging as it's been, it's been equally rewarding because of the fact that personally, um, I'm a third generation architect. I did not realize to the level of depths to which the kind of tenets of white supremacy around productivity and um, authority and hierarchy were really embedded in my, and racism in myself as a racist. And the kind of, it's, it's a, it's a gift to be able to, um, to challenge the level to which those things run deep, uh, despite my, my efforts. Um, and so this process has been helpful in being able for us all to, to do that work. Next question coming from anonymous attendee. They ask, they ask um, do your projects solely deal with single family ownership or rental, or have you dealt with either multifamily or shared ownership project models, such as co-ops, share equity, et cetera. We're in the process of, um, and Chaz is leading us on a, the submission of a design co competition, which I'm sure I don't have to name because a substantial number of us on this call are participating in it. It's called the Low Rise Challenge and it's due Friday. So we're all freaking out in the office about that. Well, not all of us, but some of us. And we're looking into that. Um, it's been, I think it's been a reckoning that we weren't prioritizing our time around that and rather an existing system of capital that we thought we could tweak, um, which in and of itself is a bit flawed. So I think what we thought we were doing was providing these kind of bite-sized applications or bite-sized pieces of capitalism to share and build power. And we're now um, a bit circumspect about that. Um, and we look forward to exploring these kind of different housing models and ownership models moving forward. Question from Nicholas Hosfested. Thanks for a great presentation and all of your work. In all of your efforts with the LA City Council and Mayor's Office, there has been, uh, has there been any meaningful discussions about how the burden of the permitting approval processes and the detriment to further empowerment and building communities and how to possibly reconstruct this? I think one of the benefits to having partners in the mayor's office and LA City Council um, for projects like Go Avenue 26, where we were testing uh, kind of new bounds of the permitting process or through our housing work, um, having folks in the mayor's office present for the amount of effort, time, and other things that go into permitting a 500 square foot unit. Um, it's, it's helpful to, to kind of have them there um, to see how the process actually works. Because I think um, it's, it's unclear until you actually go through it. And so it's kind of like a proof of concept that we've been working with in the past, where it's like, here's exactly what 
like all the steps and all the costs and all of the things that somebody has to go through in order to make an investment in themselves, in order to have a bench to sit on, on a two mile stretch of walking to a bus stop. Um, yeah. I think a big part of us calling this lecture, I heard you built benches was, it was never so simple. And that even though we would go through this process, which required all this collaboration and stakeholders and um, all these different levels of communication, there was still so much siloing happening within uh, such a big city like Los Angeles. So we were talking yesterday to someone who was in the mayor's office um, and heading up housing. And she was saying how someone approached her desk around a year and a half ago, another uh, mayoral staffer and said, I hear there's this housing crisis thing happening. It sounds like it's gonna be a really big deal for Los Angeles. And it just speaks volumes to the fact that things are in such kind of channels. And so although we were working on the kind of exposure of all that bureaucracy and its effect on the built environment, um, its effect on people's ability to kind of have identity over, over their community. Um, although we were exposing all of that, I think the challenge is, is that it's still a very effective way to demobilize people and trying to manipulate that system is, um, is more than an uphill process. And, and that's why I think in many ways we're moving to being place-based and trying to build an alternative system outside of that. And we have our next question from anonymous attendee. They ask, aside from learning from or with community organizers, social impact models, did you find any references and learnings from other industries? LA Moss was founded because the urban planning community of Los Angeles was at a much more accelerated place in the conversation they were having around uh, equity and inclusion, specifically the school, uh, UCLA had kind of historically, Maria Cabildo who facilitated our, the mission process is a graduate from UCLA. Um, and the, the planning department at UCLA um, and someone on our board, Vineet, uh, has been having a kind of incredible conversation around uh, alternative ways as a planner to really think about the city and, and, and kind of engage and partner with communities of color. So I would say that in large um, part, that conversation and that community has been our community and been the one that we've been in most uh, partnership with or most informed by and shaped by. I don't know, Chaz, I think with your DAP work, you might have far more um, ability to answer that question. Um. I would say that in designers protest, ooh, our collective is made up of designers, graphic designers, like architects, landscape architects, uh, planners and policy like advocates as well. And one of the main things, like if you kind of distill down some of the elements of many of the many kind of, um, what is it? Like program areas that we are hosting and working towards it kind of really is synthesized to like mutual aid, like interior, and then also what we're providing for other folks. Um, I, yeah, I, I think also that there's a lot of community organizers um, who organize even outside of like design oriented things um, that bring a lot of their expertise and um, kind of experience into this space through that work. Um, and so it's, the work there is also not centered around design uh, in the skills as much as it is more about um, kind of the communication and the, the organization or organizing um, capacity that folks bring. Yeah, I would just add Marie Cabildo who I mentioned, um, she's the kind of founder of ELAC, um, East Los Angeles uh, Community Corporation. And I think of, of her as someone who uh, really kind of deeply understood and committed to something beyond her profession and kind of lived her values. 
and her work at ELAC, and she went on to go back to the GSD as a uh, Loeb Fellow. Her work um, in community development is kind of, and, and being an activist has been um, a North Star for us. Thank you. And we are approaching our last question. Uh, it is also from anonymous attendee. They ask, um, as you mentioned, your longstanding commitment to social justice. I'm wondering as students, how can we further embed your approach into our education? Perhaps we can begin to look at social justice oriented models of architecture office as precedents for learning. Last year, as we were beginning to retool our framework around anti-racism, um, it was increasingly clearer uh, that even though we were putting in work ourselves to work on our interpersonal relationships, how we speak to each other, um, and embedded racism within ourselves, our history and intergenerational kind of trauma that we're carrying now, um, that that work is ongoing and it should always be present. Um, and so there's kind of a twofold where interior in architecture offices or in our office, we need to practice anti-racism if we want to do the work um, around anti-racism outwardly. And so I would say that, yes, um, one of the things that you can do is looking at um, kind of those interpersonal relationships and your own kind of relationship with systemic racism, personal racism, um, and begin to make those changes yourself and within your office. Yesterday we were talking about how much of our culture is about personal accountability and individual choice. So I would say that the intentionality around collectivity and nurturing and taking care of each other and kind of forming groups and having conversations and talking about what are the ways that you feel supported and unsupported? Where do you see yourselves and not see yourselves in your education is really important. And being able to kind of take out some of the ingrained um, top-down methods of practice and education that we've learned through the way that we present our projects or talk about our ideas or collaborate on projects is also a really important step because many of us graduate from schools of architecture and we have a very hard time talking about this, essentially this profession we all got into because we care about other people and we want to make others' lives better um, with, with these tools that we've learned. And so I would say that learning some, some forms of collaborative um, activities and, and kind of nurturing and communication is really important. And it's a really e easy, it's not easy it's work, but it's a, doing it as a student, I, I kind of wish that I had, had done that much sooner because I look back on relationships that would have been much healthier and professional opportunities that would have been much clearer for me if I had done that work at an earlier age. Thank you so much for the wonderful lecture and answering the questions. Um, and also thank you for those who ask the question and participate. Thank you. thank you. This has been great. Thanks a lot.